Let's get this out of the way right now. Is Project Almanac a good movie? Not really. Well, not objectively. Yeah, I know all art is subjective, but no one is calling this movie a cinematic masterpiece. But do I like it? Very much, yes. Let me explain. I should start out by saying I'm a sucker for anything involving time travel. I've read a ton of time travel slash alternate dimension books, and I'll watch just about any movie that includes time travel in the premise. Because of that, I'll be the first to say that I'm biased. Project Almanac is also easy for me to like because it came out when I was around the age of the characters in the movie, and the pop culture references were relevant to me at the time. This is not a high concept film by any means. With that said, I do think the movie is well worth watching if you're even remotely interested in time travel. Okay, this is your last warning. Full spoilers for Project Almanac ahead. David Raskin, our main character, is the classic, clearly good-looking person dressed up as a nerd trope. Seriously, they put glasses on him and made him kind of awkward, but he's clearly good-looking from the beginning, which is kind of relevant later. Anyway, David is smart. He got accepted into MIT with a small scholarship, but his family can't afford the remaining tuition with only his single mom's salary. As a result, his mom is planning to sell the house to pay for his school. This is where I should mention that David's father died on his seventh birthday. He was an inventor, and it seems like he was into some nondescript but revolutionary scientific stuff when he died. David and his sister Christina discover an old video camera among his dad's things with footage from David's seventh birthday. When they play the footage, they see present-day David in the background, which seems impossible. They show the footage to David's also nerdy friends Quinn and Adam, and they start to film everything, because this is a found footage movie, and that's the way it has to be. From there, some real light sci-fi happens for a while, as the teens discover that David's father built a working time machine, which is still hidden in the basement of the house. The teens get the machine working and send a small toy car into the past, but they had to use the battery from the Toyota Prius owned by David's crush, Jesse Pierce. She had parked her car on David's driveway while attending a house party nearby, but she sees the time machine in action and quickly becomes part of the group when they tell her what they're working on. From there, various time travel shenanigans ensue. The teens win the lottery, even if it's not as much as they hoped. They also impress their peers and face their bullies at school based on their knowledge of the future. And there's an extended sequence where they go to Lollapalooza, which happened months before, and spend a whole day there, only to come back less than a minute later in the present day. Initially, the teens mostly avoid the pitfalls that we see in other time travel media. They don't have any painful or traumatic experiences, and the main hiccup they encounter occurs when they find yesterday's Quinn, causing him and time travel Quinn to glitch out when they see each other. This is resolved pretty much immediately and without any ill effects. There's also a case where they accidentally bring a dog back to the present with them, but that also gets taken care of pretty quickly. Later on, or rather, months beforehand, the teens are at Lollapalooza. Christina and Adam make out, which was hinted at throughout the movie, and David has the perfect opportunity to kiss Jesse, but he gets too nervous and doesn't go through with it. This ultimately leads to the climax of the movie. David goes back in time on his own, a major no-no according to the ground rules the teens set together, and kisses Jesse this time. When he goes back to the present, he and Jesse are now together. But as a result, he also altered the timeline in ways that caused major catastrophes, both in their immediate community and around the world. Presented with this messy situation, David keeps going back in time on his own, resulting in different complications each time. Eventually, David runs into a version of Jesse on one of his trips and accidentally takes her with him. She calls him out for breaking the don't jump alone rule and for lying to her, but they encounter Jesse from the past and both Jessies disappear. David then gets chased around by the police because Jesse disappeared. Blah blah blah, blah. Hydrogen, hydrogen tank, tank from, from the school. school. Can you tell the way the time machine functions isn't interesting? And he escapes, going back in time with seconds to spare. Back at his seventh birthday party, David brings the timeline full circle by catching himself on camera, looking exactly the same as he did in the tape he and his friends found at the beginning of the movie. He encounters his soon-to-be-deceased dad and tells him that there can't really be any second chances. David destroys the time machine and disappears. We'll come back to this later. The film cuts back to David and Christina, with no memories of the film's events, as they now find two cameras among their father's belongings, one of which contains the footage of the film's events. Finally, David approaches Jesse in the lunchroom at school and tells her that they're going to, quote-unquote, change the world. 
don't worry, we'll dig into this in a second. First, let's talk about some things I like. This is minor, but I like that the motion sensor drone tech in the beginning is... plausible? I'm about 100% sure this technology exists now, but when the movie came out in 2015, it seemed like exactly the kind of mildly futuristic extension of existing technology that might impress a college admissions department at a school like MIT. The characters are mostly good, and the dialogue isn't terrible, even though it's a little cringy sometimes. The teens definitely fall into classic stereotypes, but they have distinct enough personalities and to be honest, I think they're more similar to actual teens than what we see in a lot of teen movies. I like that the movie seems to be self-aware and tries to subvert tropes of the time travel genre, like when they win the lottery but only a little, or when Quinn tries to use time travel to show off in class but ends up having to actually learn the material because his teacher asks different questions every time. These are fun scenes and they foreshadow how unpredictable time travel can be before things start to get darker. I also like how the movie implies that the teens had the power to make their lives better from the beginning. The time machine emboldened them and put them in new situations, but it's clear that all of them could have taken steps outside of time travel to improve their lives. David could have approached Jesse sooner, or vice versa. Christina could have stood up to her bully earlier. You get the idea. The time machine was the trigger that allowed them all to become their best selves, but the movie makes it clear that they could have done most of that anyway. This is strictly personal, but this movie features a few of my favorite tropes from anything time travel related. In particular, it always gets to me when the protagonist encounters a family member or love interest outside of the present. I have trouble putting this feeling into words, but there's something that feels so impactful when Jesse calls David out for messing up their timeline without having full knowledge of everything that he's changed, and you can see her fear about all the damage he could be doing. When she then encounters her other self and blinks out of existence, it makes it that much clearer how much David has at stake. Similarly, it got to me that David's dad recognizes him when David goes back to his seventh birthday. His dad seems to immediately realize just how far out of his depth he is with the time travel stuff, and it's a nice moment even though it's so brief. Now let's talk about some things I don't like. I can summarize most of my issues with this. The time travel rules don't make sense, and the filmmakers seem to rely on multiverse concepts without acknowledging that fact at all. The thing about people skipping in and out of existence, like a malfunctioning computer program, looks cool in this movie, but it makes the already foggy time travel rules of this film even less clear. When Quinn sees himself from yesterday, why does he skip out only then? And why doesn't the fact that he saw his time traveling self change the timeline entirely? And why is he able to walk away when the two Jessies both disappear after seeing each other? By the way, even though the film came out in 2015, they filmed at Lollapalooza in 2013, which helps explain why Atlas Genius performing Trojans was the main musical set piece. I like the song, and Atlas Genius for that matter, but it did feel a little out of place in 2015 when the song had been out for a while and it really wasn't popular for all that long. Also, when David goes back to Lollapalooza to make his move on Jesse, shouldn't the original version of him still be there? I'd ask how David got the other version of himself out of the picture, but it seems clear that they didn't think of that when they wrote the movie, so it's a moot point. I don't want to go too hard on this angle, but how exactly did he go back to the same Lollapalooza timeline where his friends were anyway? Or did he jump back to before they went to Lollapalooza in the first place, then jump to Lollapalooza with the group, then go all the way back to the present? Again, it seems like they just didn't think of this. The fact that the film is found footage doesn't really make it better. It doesn't necessarily make the movie worse, but it does feel unnatural that they start filming everything, and like any found footage movie, it's almost distracting how little people acknowledge the fact that someone is filming them at all times. This fades as the film goes on, though, so it's not a huge issue for me. There are fair criticisms of the movie's ending, namely, if David created a dead timeline when he destroyed the time machine, why does the camera still exist? Are the David and Christina we see at the end of the movie living in the same timeline where David destroyed the time machine? If so, why did the other David just disappear? But I can set all of that aside. As I said, it's not a complicated movie, so I'm not that mad about the inconsistencies. But David's line about changing the world at the end makes me itchy. Did he not see the same movie that we just saw? First off, isn't the main component of the time machine destroyed already? Sure, they could recreate all the parts that they built themselves, but they can't rebuild the main part, right? Even if they could make it happen, they absolutely should not try to change the world with the time machine anymore. It clearly went very badly before. 
Okay, since we're on the topic of the movie's ending, I should discuss the alternate endings. I found two of them. In the first one, we see a different version of the scene where David shows Christina and his friends the tape from his seventh birthday party. This time, it shows present-day Jesse instead of David. I think this would have been a far more compelling ending, and it could have set up a sequel. It's far too late for that, but I would have loved to see them explore what happens after the past and present versions of people cancel each other out. Though I will say, again, how would they ever explain what happened to put Jesse in the footage in the first place? The other alternate ending is a lot less interesting. It's really just a different version of the scene early in the film, when David ends up with Jesse's backpack. But David notices her keychain this time, and makes the connection to the footage where he's holding her keys in the mirror. It would have been a very anticlimactic ending, so I'm glad they went in a different direction. It's clear that I'm not the only one who loves time travel as a plot device in movies, TV shows, and books, so maybe you don't need any convincing that this movie is worth watching. I've made it very clear that the movie isn't objectively great, and there are parts that don't make sense, but I will die on this hill. It's still kind of a good movie. It's only a few years old, but it already feels like a cultural relic from a simpler time. This is obviously amplified by COVID-19, and the fact that music festivals haven't been happening for what feels like years now, but the events of the film seem so far in the past somehow. Unfortunately, Project Almanac didn't do great at the box office. Six years down the road, it seems extremely unlikely that a sequel will ever be made. The movie wasn't very successful financially or in terms of reviews, so there's nothing we can do about that. And I think that makes sense. I appreciate the film for what it's worth, and I'll still give it a watch every few years. Thanks for watching! I'm always looking for more time travel stuff, so if you have other good recommendations that feature time travel, let me know in the comments. Okay, really quick. When they first find the camera, why does Christina say, When did we get a video camera? It's clearly an old camera, even for the time, and they're in the attic. It's not a brand new camera in the box or anything, so the question doesn't really make sense. This line really gets me. You enter the time here, and you just press the red button, and boom, you're Doctor Who. Topical. Topical reference, thank you. Also, he's just the doctor. They do the classic enhance thing when they're looking at the camera footage from David's seventh birthday. The original shot isn't very high quality, but when they zoom in on the ballerina keychain, it's clear as day. Alright, that's it. Thanks guys.